<laughs> Not at all, huh? <clears throat> okay. This morning, we're going to continue in our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study. We're in the book of John, and we are in chapter 10. Specifically, chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. Mm. So, Lord, bless this time and just help us again to have um, ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance. An interesting uh, concept. The writer, a socialist minister whose name was Francis Bellamy, in 1892, hoped that this particular uh, pledge would be shared throughout all of the world and used in all countries. We know it as, uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now that's how we know it. But, that is not how it was written. Okay? So when we look back to how it was written in its original form, it read, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That way it could kind of be adapted to any country, any kind of situation, and it made sense. But in 1923, the words, to the flag of the United States of America, were added. A little more personalized, okay? And then, when you were making that pledge, you were to salute... And when you would say, I pledge allegiance to the flag, then you would take your hand and you would point out uh, to the flag that you were looking at. Except that there was this period of history where this idea was very unpopular. And that we know is because of Hitler and the things that he was was, uh, propagating and the hatred of the Jews, okay? So <clears throat> that is, is kind of, was the struggle, I would say. Um, <clears throat> and then that was changed a bit. So instead of saluting the flag and pointing to the flag, you would take your hand and place it over your heart. And <clears throat> then in 1954, President Eisenhower encouraged Congress to add the words under God. Now, how many of you knew all that history? Good for you. Good for you. I did not. So this has been kind of um, a a fun thing because, you know, you you grow up saying the Pledge of Allegiance, you you stand, you... You do that kind of thing, and you don't necessarily realize all the changes, all the little things that have happened over the years and in order to, to uh, get the pledge that we have now. So what does this have to do with <clears throat> John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42? I pledge allegiance. Well, <clears throat> in John chapter 2, or 10, verses 22. John writes that it was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. So when was this? Now, we kind of have to think back a little bit when we kind of got into John and into Christmas, and we started talking about Kislev, Uh, 25th or December 25th, which is also um, the time of Hanukkah. And, you know, we think of it as snowy and Christmas lights everywhere and that kind of thing. Not the case here, even though 
this celebration of Hanukkah or the festival of dedication or allegiance in a sense. Okay, you're dedicating yourself, you're dedicating the, the temple uh, was the case here. And what is um, Hanukkah in essence? Well, when we think back to that day and age, um, when they were having this celebration, it was a period of history that was not so good. Antiochus Epiphanes was just a horrific, horrific man. He did so many evil deeds against the Jewish people. He hated them dearly. He destroyed their communities. He uh, killed them in very violent, evil ways. But then to, to take it one step further, he went into the temple and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. And we know that Jews hold to a dietary um, regiment that only holds to clean um, animals. And there were specific laws that they would follow in order to hold to that. A lot of those laws we don't necessarily see today, but one of them was is that you had to stay away from bacon. I know, that would be rough, wouldn't it? You know, And ham. I love ham. I love bacon. It's good. But in that day and age, there could have been some problems. There could have been some issue just with cooking it, even as there are today. And so the Lord would say, I want you to stay away from that. I want you to hold to a diet that's going to be a little healthier for you. Um, you're going to be a little happier. Now, I've been on a diet. And I got on the scale this morning, and I was really glad to see that I'm down 12 pounds. It was, you know, really exciting. In spite of the fact that my loving wife went out and bought some of those Girl Scout <laughs> crack <laughs> cookies. And now I hadn't eaten much on Valentine's um, Day. And when I got home... Um, from an ambulance call, um, I took Charlie out to, to dinner for Valentine's. <laughs> anyway, when I got back, there's those cookies. And I thought, okay, just a couple is not going to be that bad, you know. And I think that there's five in a row and there's three rows. So there's 15 cookies in a box of those, what do they call them, Samoas. They got the caramel and the chocolate and the coconut and... And, okay, so, you know, they're kind of like Lay's potato chips. You know, you can't just eat one, so I ate two. And then I ate three and four and five, and I thought, okay, that's enough. i got to put them away, and I put them away. And about an hour later, I could hear the Girl Scout cookies calling me again. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, I've already blown it. So I ate the whole rest of the whole, whole box. Oh, my God. Anyhow, <laughs> that has nothing to do with the teaching whatsoever today. So, but Antiochus Epiphany was so mean and so evil um, and was so obnoxious when it came to some of the things uh, that were done in the temple that he left it so defiled <clears throat> that a, a group... Um, called the Maccabees, um, really were frustrated. And they gathered up what little they could for weapons. And they said, you know what? We're going to go to battle. We're going we're gonna, to, in a sense, die for our Lord and try and save Jerusalem. And they went to war and they won. <clears throat> now, even though they won, they went into the temple and began to try and clean some of that up. And they were going to begin the rededication process, recommitting uh, um, that building to the Lord, recommitting themselves to the Lord, re remaking that allegiance that they have to him. <clears throat> Which is kind of how this festival came about. When they went to go light the, the lamps uh, again. Back then, 
they didn't have like what we do here sometimes in the morning where you just push the remote control and the candles just light up, you know? They didn't have that. They had oil lamps, little oil lamps, and that lamp would usually hold about a day's worth of oil and you could light that and it would burn all day long. Well, they only found one jar of oil. They filled one of the lamps, they lit it, and it took them several more days before they could come up with a batch of, of uh, properly um, dedicated and properly produced oil so that it was holy, it was pure, it was done the way it would need to be for church or for, for the temple and the tabernacle. And so <clears throat> in lighting that, they thought, well, we only have one day left. Lord, I don't, you know, I don't know what we're going to do this you know, this candle's going to burn out or this lamp is going to burn out. And what should have lasted one day lasted eight days until a full new batch could be done. And you say, well, I don't, I don't recall seeing that in the Old Testament. Well, it doesn't really matter. There's not necessarily big giant separations of time because the Bible is God's word. It's all one. And where is it mentioned? It's mentioned right here. So we know that it was happening. It was being celebrated because John says... Hey, guess what we're, we're doing right now? It's wintertime, it's Hanukkah, or what we would consider to be what? Christmas time, right? A celebration of not so much when Jesus was born, but the very likelihood of when the light entered into this world, when Jesus was conceived. And so <clears throat> that is kind of um, where we're at right now. They are recommitting themselves to the Lord, recommitting um, the temple to the Lord in this festival of dedication, which is exactly what Hanukkah means, de dedication. Verse 23, he was in the temple, Jesus was in the temple, walking through the sections known as Solomon's Colonnade. And the people surrounded him. Now, th this isn't so much just the people. We're talking about the religious leaders, those that continue to harass Jesus. And when it says that they surrounded him, the idea there isn't that they're surrounding him in order to listen to him. It's more along the lines of, we're going to harass you more. We're going to try and put you on the spot again. And we're going to try and finish this thing once and for all. And so it's really kind of um, a trap, a setup again. Jesus, to this point, has been pretty good at uh, getting out of them so to speak, because he's God and he knows how to do that. Well, the people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, in that day and age, if you said that you were the Messiah, you're going to be taken out into the, the potter's field and you're going to get stoned, okay? You were never to say that. That was only to be the Messiah. And so now what they want is Jesus to proclaim that he is what? God. He's the Messiah. He is the Christ. And in surrounding him, they are looking for the opportunity. They probably brought their rocks in their bags ready to go anyway so that they could stone him right there. But they're kind of sick of this guy. It's kind of the idea of what's going on. So they meet him in or at the temple. <clears throat> and they surround him, and they say, now tell us the truth. Are you the Messiah? Now, we've already gotten to chapter 10 here. How many times through all of John have we seen Jesus say that he is the same as the Father, that he and the Father are one, that I am? You know, I, over and over and over, Jesus has said those words. He has made... There shouldn't be any question mark um, in his mind. And we just got through at the first part of the chapter where Jesus said, I am the shepherd. I'm the head over the sheep. You are the sheep. I am the shepherd. I am God. He puts himself in that position. And yet here they're saying, hey, well, we're just not sure. They want him to say the words, I am the Messiah. That way they can take him out and stone him or stone him on the spot, whichever is easiest, right? So verse 25, Jesus replied, I already told you, and you didn't believe me. 
Well, the proof is the work that I do in my Father's name. I like that because when we think about what Jesus had done, he just got through healing who? The blind man. Remember, he spat on the ground. He mixed it up into mud, put put it in the guy's eyes um, who had been blind from birth. And Jesus recreated him some working uh, eyeballs. And um, he said, yeah, I believe this guy must be a prophet or somebody special. He accepts the Lord, says, I believe in him. And then the religious leaders kick him out of church. You know, and <clears throat> so here Jesus is speaking them to them and he says, I already have shown you proof. Yeah. The proof is the work and the deeds that I've done. I've healed the blind. I have um, opened the mouths of the mute. I have um, those that could not walk. I have healed their legs, the crippled, the lame, <clears throat> the woman who had been bleeding for years. I have raised people from the dead uh-huh. and I have fed thousands upon thousands of people with a handful of loaves and a few fishes. And yet you have asked for signs. You want me to prove myself. I mean, can you do any of this? I also ask, if you know that I've sinned, then come right out and say, exactly what it is that I've done. And nobody could present any sin. They had no proof of any wrongdoing. And yet Jesus says, the proof that I am God is in the work that I do. So how do we know if something really is from God? Look at the work, you know? We check it out and we see if it measures up to the word. If the work doesn't measure up to the word, then it's not from the Lord, okay? So here, then in verse 26, Jesus goes on to say, but you don't believe in me because you are not my sheep. Now, I like the language here because the language um, is is quite simplistic in its, its idea. And they tend to, if we were to interpret their language, it would... It would almost be, because you're my sheep, then you will believe. But because you don't believe, then you're not my sheep. It's kind of real basic in in its concept. And Jesus is speaking to them as though he were maybe speaking to a third grader, you know, and saying, look, the reason that you don't believe is because you're not my sheep, okay? Because my sheep believe in me. And if you believed in me, then you would be my sheep. But because you're not my sheep, you don't believe. This is pretty pretty basic. <clears throat> well, my sheep listen to my voice. How do you know if somebody is really a sheep, a Christian? Because they listen to what the Lord tells them to do in the word. I know them and they follow me. Another uh, thing that they do is they follow what the scriptures say. They do what the Lord has said for them to do, and they follow God's instructions. Verse 28, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Now, this is an interesting um, phrase as well, because Greek doesn't exactly translate into English the same way. This is like a double negative. How, how many of you grew up with a mom that was very much into English? and would tell you you cannot put a double negative together because then it's a positive. Do you want some of this? No, I don't. I don't not not want any. You know what I mean? That whole double negative thing. Yeah, I don't want none of that. Okay, there you go. Which means you actually do want it. Well, this is a double negative, but in the Greek language, the double negative just gives it that much more... Um, intensity. So he says here, I give them eternal life and they will never or never, never perish. We would translate in our language, they will never, ever perish. Okay. But in the Greek, it would be never, never perish. So, which means that they would actually perish. But again, that's Greek. Okay. It's all Greek to me, right? But that is interesting because we know that 
If the proof, proof is in the work, then it's also going to be manifest in the word. If you are a sheep, then you will listen to um, his voice and you will follow and obey. But also in doing that, you will never, never, ever perish. You will have eternal life. This is Jesus saying these things. And I like that because the only person that has the authority, the only person that has the power to say, if you listen to what I say and do and obey what I've told you to do, then you will live forever in heaven. The only person that has that kind of power is who? God. Okay, so Jesus is God. Well, no one can snatch <clears throat> my sheep from me. Nobody can take um, the sheep away from the Father. That's one thing that I really appreciate about Jesus. He doesn't lose sheep, okay? He is a good shepherd. He does not lose any sheep, including those that <clears throat> somebody tries to snatch from me. Doesn't happen. For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. That's where we say, greater is he that is in us than he that's in this world. We're not going to, if we are in the hands of the Father, we are not going to get plucked out by Satan. He might be able to harass you. He might be able to oppress you. But he can never overtake or overcome you. <clears throat> he um, has to stay away because you are in the Father's hands. Verse 30, the Father and I are one. So there's no question, again, even though he's not saying the words Messiah, he's saying, hey, we are one in person, one in purpose, one in um, intent, but we are also one, and we don't really understand the whole idea behind the Trinity because we don't really have anything much like that here. We can say, oh, well, it's like an apple. It's got a skin, it's got a meat, and it's got seed in the middle. Well, yeah, but it's got a lot of other things to it as well. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, okay? We don't understand it. If we understood that, what would you be? You would be God, okay? We are going to become like God when we get to heaven. We're going to be like him, knowing all things, because Jesus says when we see him face to face, we're going to get that understanding. We're going to get that knowledge. But until then, we have to take him, his word um, exactly as he says it. And there's no reason to doubt it because the proof is in the work. All right? So the Father and I are one. Jesus is saying, okay, here it is. I am God. Verse 31, once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. And Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? Yeah. Well, they replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. They wanted Jesus dead, not because he was a rebel, not because he did great things for the people, they wanted Jesus dead because he was proclaiming himself to be who? God. God. And that to them was blasphemy. <clears throat> Which is interesting. Because a lot of people say that, you know, well, Jesus didn't die. He just died for this or that. No, he died because he was God. He was put on the cross because they believed that he was claiming to be God. And they believed him to be a mere man. But he wasn't. He was all man, but he was also all God. Another concept that we can't understand because we're all man. We're all human, okay? <clears throat> well, Jesus replied, it is it written in your own scriptures, okay? It is written in your own laws. You've came up with your own little things, and they did, because Jesus gave them how many commandments? Ten. Ten. Okay, you don't even have to use your toes. I'm going to give you 10, and they couldn't even follow that. They had to be much more specific, much more directed. And so they came up with hundreds and hundreds of ideas and laws and things like that. Well, Jesus replied, it is written in your own scriptures that God said to certain leaders of the people, 
I say you are gods. Now, the idea here in that word gods is the same as uh, that of a judge. In fact, when we look at the Old Testament, the word judge is Elohim, which is also one of the names that we use for who? God. Okay? Elohim. And so they would appoint themselves as judges over the people. So these religious leaders said, no, we are Elohim. We are God over the people. We are the shepherd. And even as we talked about last week, no, you're not, okay? Because you're sitting in the pulpit doesn't make you the shepherd. You're just a sheep with some experience. That's really all you are, okay? And so the Lord would say to these people that were supposed to be sheep helping the other sheep follow the Lord, the good shepherd, they weren't. They were kind of trying to segment their own thing. Well, who else was it right from the very beginning of time tried to declare himself to be God because of the fact that he was a great worship leader and he had so much control that when he spoke, all of heaven rejoiced with him and he said, then I must be God. Oh yeah, Satan. And what did he do? He had to go off by himself. Here's the thing. And we need to grab a hold of this concept so we understand who these religion religious leaders are. Jesus says in his word that rebellion, anything that goes against God, when you say, okay, I know what the truth is, but I don't care. I'm going to do it my own way. That rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You are basically choosing sides. You're saying, I don't want to be part of the Lord. I don't want that. I'm going to rebel against what God has told me to do in his word, and I'm going to go do my own thing. You are basically now worshiping Satan. You are involved essentially in, like, witchcraft by rebelling. That's a dangerous, dangerous place to be because now you're opening up your mind and your heart to some pretty evil, evil things. Well, here, these religious leaders are being reminded by Jesus that they have set themselves up to be Elohim, or judges or rulers over the people. The same as as God. We read in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus didn't even consider equality with God something to be grasped. Why? Because Jesus was sent here to do what? A job, to die on the cross for our sins. So he didn't put himself on that position. Rather, he put himself under the Father and said, I will do whatever you want me to do. I will listen and go. I will heal. I will touch. I will minister. I will do. Boy, what a great position for you and I to be, to say, Lord, we are not Elohim. We are not judges of other people. We're, We're not really leaders. We are your sheep. We need to be taught. We need to follow you. And then we take and we put ourselves under the Father and say, we're going to listen to you. And Jesus would say, if you can do that, then you are my sheep. You are my sheep. I like that. Well, these guys were gods over the people. They set themselves up that way. And you know that the scriptures cannot be altered. Can't change scripture. So, if the people who receive God's message were called gods, then why do you call it blasphemy when I say that I am a son of God or under God? You're putting yourself on the equal plane. I'm saying I'm just a son. I have no more, I have no power except for that which is given from above. So you're calling me because I call myself a son of God or under God. Yet you guys put yourself at the same level as God over the people. And yet what you say is not blasphemy? How does that work? After all, the Father sent me apart and sent me into the world. I don't or don't believe me unless I carry out my Father's work. Look, you can choose whatever you're wanting to do, religious leaders. But my father sent me. I have a job to do. I am going to continue to do that job, regardless of the fact 
that you don't believe. So, do whatever you want. Verse 38. <clears throat> but if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miracles or the miraculous works I have done, even if you don't believe in me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So look, you may not like me. You may think I'm uh, t teaching heresy. You may think that I am putting myself in the same position of God, but I'm not. I call myself under God, a son. You guys set yourselves on the same playing field or same level as God. And yet, what works have you done? What miraculous things have you done? <laughs> Nothing. And how many had Jesus done? Okay, so look, even if you don't believe in me, believe in the work that I'm doing. Yeah. If it was so evil, then why is it helping people? Right. Why is it following what the scriptures have said, that we need to take care of our brothers and our sisters? We need to meet the needs of others. These guys didn't do that. If they had a mom or dad that was struggling financially, you know what they would do? Even though they had money, they'd say, well, no, I can't. I, I can't help you out, mom and dad. I know I got some money and I know you know I have money, but that money is dedicated. That money has been pledged. That money is, you know, allied to the father and I, I, can't, I can't use it. Can't help you out, sorry. And so they would just let their parents suffer. They would let them starve. How is that put? I mean, God didn't do that. He didn't. He didn't set himself up like that. He he says, "I'm the shepherd. I'm going to take care of you, and you guys should be able to tell. Just even if you don't like me, you should be able to tell who I am just because of the work that I did and the and the love that I have towards people and the care that I am showing. You should at least be interested in that, even if you don't like me." Kind of sounds like our presidential situation right now, doesn't it? Oh, we don't like Trump. He's a jerk. Yeah, but he's done some good things. So, you know, <clears throat> even if you don't like them, have some respect for that position and the things that they do accomplish. Whatever the president or whoever the president might be, look at how the Lord is leading and guiding and directing those, whether it be Trump or Obama or uh, the Clintons or, or whatever. If you look back, you will find good deeds that were done. <clears throat> Verse 39, once again, they tried to arrest him. So they put down their stones and then they were going to lay hold of him and uh, he got away. Again? Okay, now, I'm no genius, but this is like, you know... Several times now that Jesus just kind of disappeared and walked away. Now, can you do that? Can you walk through that wall and just leave our present? No. You would think that just the simplicity of, you know, that thinking of like, wow, you can walk through walls and just disappear when people are trying to grab a hold of it. I've never seen that before, you know. <clears throat> Not even the magicians can do that. Well, you would think, but once again, yeah. these guys are so stubborn. And it is interesting because who also hardened his heart against God? <clears throat> Not only Satan. You're right, very much so, and got kicked out of heaven. But Pharaoh did. And it came to his destruction, didn't, didn't it? Even though the miracles were being done right in front of them, he just said, oh yeah, I can see it, I know it, I don't care. I'm going to harden my heart, I don't care. I'm not letting the people go. Okay, you asked for it, you know, you wanted your heart hardened, then that's what I'll give you, you know? And you can tell the same thing is happening here to the hearts of these leaders. Verse 40, he went beyond the Jordan River, near the place where John was first baptized and stayed there a while. You know, it's so good to get away when somebody's harassing you or, you know, you just like, you know what? I'm going to go sit by some water. I love to go to the ocean and hang out there. Just so much peace and so much calm. 
And Jesus refers to his word as water. And when you're going through some struggles, some difficulties, some trials that seem to be just kind of overwhelming, then crack open that Bible and just sit there and find that peace in the word. Well, Jesus goes off. <clears throat> he goes and sits by the Jordan. But many followed him. John <clears throat> didn't perform miraculous signs. They remarked to one another, but everything he said about this man has come true. And many who were there believed in Jesus. And why did they believe in Jesus? Because they were his sheep. Okay? We need to look at the word and just take it for what it says. You don't have to read into it. You didn't, there's enough there. I mean, the, it's pretty thick depending on how big the letters are that you have to, you know, use. But there's enough there that can guide us all through life for all of our lives. And I don't think you, you can go deep enough into that word. But I'll tell you what, every time that I've been struggling or going through a difficult time, to be able to open up the word and just hear the Father speak to my heart, speak to my mind. Boy, it gives me a peace that passes all understanding. The same thing happens here to these folks. Though Jesus left the temple and he went out to the Jordan, the people followed. Why? Because they what? They believed. They committed themselves to Jesus. They pledged themselves to him. They gave their allegiance to them. They dedicated themselves. You know, Jesus refers to us as temples of the... Holy Spirit, right? And we sometimes need to do a little housework or some yeah, temple yeah. cleanup, you know? I would say that we're here today so that we are reminded again that we need to be dedicated, that we need to pledge our allegiance to the Lord and say, Father, come in and help clean up my temple. Bring in more of the Holy Spirit, which is oil in the Scripture. Bring that in so that I might continue to shine brightly. That the fire that is in me, even if it's maybe died down a little bit, will be rekindled. And that we can go out and be a light for you. Amen? Amen. So Father, help us to dedicate ourselves, to pledge our allegiance to you. Knowing, Lord, that as we do, Father, you are going to fill us with your spirit. You are going to move us to be doing your works, to be moving us into all truth. And Father, I am so grateful that today we can spend a little bit of time being refreshed in the water of your word, knowing that you are God, that you rose again from the dead, and that Father, by believing in you, we are your sheep. We put ourselves under your care. And if we haven't done that, then Lord, I pray that <clears throat> if there are folks that are needing to do that, that they would commit to you today. They would say, Lord, I'm going to pledge my allegiance to you. I'm going to dedicate my temple, my tabernacle, my life to you. Help me to follow. Help me to listen. Help me to obey the things that you have said in your word. Thank you, Lord, again for sharing with us here in John. May we continue to do what, Father, you have asked us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>